secrets we're keeping could be used to light the dark. But we If someone had asked you to describe your current state of mind, you would have said you felt like a ghost who had gotten lost while trying to cross to another side, gave up, and then decided to rent an apartment in limbo. But since that was an insult to actual ghosts, you actually knew you would instead describe yourself as a comedian who had been fired because he could no longer remember how to be funny. It wasn't even a metaphor, but was a lot more accurate. What do you mean you're cutting my act? You ask your manager, trying your best to sound indigenous. I mean exactly that. People come to MTT Resort to relax and have a good laugh. But your one-liners about people having allergies that are acting up because of all the dust that's in the air are inappropriate and insensitive. But tragedy is based off comedy. You're missing a key ingredient to the mix, which is time. It's only been six months, Sans. People may not talk about it anymore, but it's still too soon. Hey, hey, don't give me that look. Think of it this way. You'll get more time to practice a new routine, and some rookie will finally get a big break with, the, with your time slot. You've already found another comedian to replace me? No, no, not another comedian. An illusionist. Relative of Mad Jack, I think. What was their name again? Sour Say? Anyway, I'm sorry I have to do this to you, but it's clear you're still not ready to return to the stage life. So until you're fully recuperated, we're going to have to put you on mandatory leave. You exit the hotel under a cloud of humiliation. Damn it, was it really that obvious? After coming to terms with your head, deciding feelings just weren't a thing you were allowed to have anymore, you spent days practicing in front of a mirror on how to act normal so you could blend in without no being noticed. You used to be good at it. You don't understand. Everyone else around you seems to be figuring out how to be happy again. So why couldn't you? Obviously because you don't deserve it. Instead of fast traveling home, you decide to take the scenic route by touring the core and circling back through Hotland. You chose to walk mostly because it would take longer that way. Being home alone with a lot of free time on your hands was not exactly where you wanted to be in this case. Any stupid ideas popped in your head. At least in public you had to maintain an appearance. You and eyes watched you. The comedy club was just one of the few escapes you had from total isolation. But now you've lost that. Look at you. No matter how hard you try to hide it, everyone still knows. You'd better just do something before you start becoming a burden to everyone. It's not fair to make them put up with your shit. The heat from the core hits you like a brick wall when you enter. Low mechanical whirls and hums reverberate through the air as you mandarin through and steam bellowing in the dim light. The core, the fuel source of all the underground. Here, geothermal energy is converted to magic energy, which is then used to power everything beneath the mountain. It's our greatest and most important invention. You wander through the corridors in silence, listening to the gigantic machine tirelessly work away, until you come to a bridge spanning across a chasm. Down below, a white-hot concoction of magma and magic pulsates like a heartbeat. In the distance, you can hear the hiss of ice blocks hitting the lava as it perpetually tries to keep the entire mechanism from overheating. You aimlessly begin to cross the bridge when something makes you pause and study the glowing liquid rock beneath you. The longer you idle, the more your thoughts begin to roam. Unaware, you begin to space out. The raw, unharnessed magic that the core produces is extremely powerful and vital. It's been theorized that coming into contact with the magic of the, this caliber 
would cause the test subject entire being to be shattered across all the con controversial time and space, and as in the way of such arcane enchantment. The magma bubbles and flows. Its shifting colors memorize you, and you inch closer to the railing, transfixed. If you fell in, the reaction would cause you to simultaneously exist everywhere and nowhere at once. But you wouldn't technically die. Slowly, unconsciously, you begin to lean forwards over the safety rails. At least you'd finally be out of everyone's way. Oh, hey, Sans, is that you? A woman's voice snaps you out of your trance. You look over your shoulder and spot a familiar yellow dinosaur heading your way. Fancy meeting you here, Sans. What brings you to Hotland? Oh, hey, Alpheus. Your face twists and contorts as you try to remember what a smile is supposed to feel like. Based on Alpheus' reaction, whatever you managed to pull must have looked strained and forced. I'm just passing through. Oh, really? Uh, cool. I was just running errands for Asgard myself. An awkward silence passes between you. Both of you sweat, but you don't think it's from the heat. Hey, I never did properly repay you for that coffee, she says suddenly. Repay? Coffee? Alpheus, that was months ago. I, I, I know, but you really helped me that day, more than you know. And, and, I'd like to return the favor. Return the favor? Shit. Was your face really that easy to read? Would, would you, um, like to come over to my lab for, um, uh, some, uh, ice and tea and cake? The dinosaur trembled violently for such an innocent question, and your silence sure didn't help the situation. If you say no, she's going to think she did something wrong. And then she'll blame herself. Just say yes. It'll give you an excuse not to go home yet anyway. Sure, you say at last, and the reptile exhales in relief. That sounds nice. Please, lead the way. Listening to Alpheus talk as she guided you through Hotland was a welcome change of pace. Along the way, she told you all kinds of trivia about Hotland's puzzles, history, and architecture. You have figured she talked so much just to keep herself busy, but you couldn't complain. As long as she rambled on, you just had to listen. And as long as you just had to listen, you didn't have to think. Well, here we are. She announced when you approached a large white building. My, uh, humble abode. She cracks an uncertain grin, but invites you inside nevertheless. The first thing you notice about Alpheus' lab is the clutter. Benches and tables line the walls, each stacked high with files and folders of what you can only assume is her research. Posters of cartoony humans with large eyes and colorful hair plasters the walls in a hodgepodge manner. Each bookcase is full of movies and comics in a language you can't read, fighting for space on the shelves. It reminds you very much of your own room, the only difference being her living space was organized chaos, whereas yours was self-perpetuating tornado of garbage. Uh, pardon the mess. He here's... Er, uh, follow me upstairs. You take an escalator up to the loft where there are more bookshelves and workbenches, but it's noticeably less messy up here. Make yourself comfortable. I'll get the refreshments. You pull up a chair to a small table showcasing a lone figure of a human with cat ears and a tail. The table is in the cleanest part of the whole room, but the little statue kind of weirds you out. You turn it around so it's facing the wall. Sorry for the wait. Alpheus apologized when she returns a few minutes later. I'm kind of magically inept, so I have to heat up tea the old-fashioned way. She sets the table, placing three cups and a coffee cake between you. Puzzled, you watch as she first cuts you a generous slice of the cake, then serves tea for three, handing one cup off to you, one for herself, and taking the last cup to the flower pot on her bedstand. When you take a closer look, you see the pots holding small purple flowers with many petals. Two photos, one of Undying and one of Metaton, rest against it. 
along with small vials of dust. What's that? You dare to ask. Oh, eh, it's a, a little memorial I keep of my friends. Elpheus answers, almost embarrassed. I, uh, learned about these kind of altars from all the, an all the anime I watch. The purple flowers are asterisks. Uh, synthetic, of course. They don't grow down here, so I made them myself. In flower language, they mean, I won't forget you. And in Japanese culture, it's not uncommon to serve a portrait of your meal to the deceased. Since I couldn't decide what to s spread metadons and undying's dust on, I decided I'd honor them in a different way. You couldn't decide? Well, if you want to get technical, Alpheus took a seat across from you, smiling fondly. If I wanted to spread Metaton's dust on things he loved most, he'd end up being spread pretty thin since I'd have to put a little bit of him on absolutely everything. All the world's a stage, darling, and I'm the he headlining role, he used to say. In the end, I just gave his dust back to his cousin, save for the small bit I kept for the altar. As for undying, I know I was her best friend, but I feel ashamed to say I didn't even know what she loved most. Was it her armor? Her spears? Some could argue she loved protecting all of us most, but I couldn't really go around sp sprinkling dust on everybody. You clear your throat after a sip of tea. A notion occurs to you. You got the idea from anime, you say slowly, knitting your brow. Doesn't that make this memorial a human tradition then? Alpheus visibly winces at your words. Y yes, but, y you know, see, it's like... Uh, I know a human was the one who, who... The dinosaur stutters. Shit. That reaction was bad. Did you really sound that accusatory? You hadn't meant for your words to come out that way. You were just curious. Embarrassed. You take a bite of coffee cake. But it's dry and tasteless in your mouth. Oh, who am I kidding? I know it seems almost insulting, doesn't it? But... It, it just helped me cope, knowing I could keep their memory alive this way. Well, maybe I just too, maybe I'm just too afraid to admit it. I, I didn't want to throw their dust to the wind and be done with it. I wasn't ready to move on that fast. I still don't think I am. Look at what you've done, you heartless, insulting freak. Just because you don't find peace doesn't mean you deserve to ruin others. I, I'm sorry. You apologize. Upon seeing how upset you made her. Oh, I, I shouldn't have questioned something that helped you overcome your grief. No, no, I, I understand. Elpheus tries to reassure you. You had to fight the human personally, so I could see where you're coming from if everything human-related upsets you. I, uh, if it makes you feel any better, it was knowing that there are, are people like you out there that really helped me go keep going. People like me? Yeah, you know. Undying, Metaton. You all fought the human to, to protect the rest of us. Knowing that, I have to keep going. Undying and Metaton didn't die to see me give up, so I'll stay strong for their sake. Glad to see you holding up better than I am, you mumble. Re really Alpheus asks, picking up something in your tone. D didn't you have anything that helped you keep going? Not anymore. The silence that follows is suffocating as Alphia studies you with concern. Crap. Was she onto you? Ugh. You didn't want to get her tangled up in your problems. As always, Alphia's is the first to break the quiet. I I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a few. Alphia scurries off, leaving you alone with your thoughts unsupervised. You exhale in relief. Living on so your friend's efforts don't go in vain? It was honest enough reason. It was a humble enough reason. Too bad you didn't have any reason to keep living for. But Papyrus... Papyrus died trying to be friend the little beast. He didn't sacrifice anything. He wasn't a maitre. And to say, I continue to exist so the memory of my brother being Turn to power always lives on isn't exactly poetic or noble. You take another sip of tea, but it's cold and bitter. Man, 
Alfia sure is taking her time in the bathroom. You figure she... figures she's offended you somehow. And now... feels ashamed of it. This could be further from the truth, but how do you casually tell someone you can't feel feelings anymore? And that literally impossible for you to be insulted without completely alarming them. She was just trying to be nice. But because you can't even put a goddamn smile on your face once in a while, you're making her think she's doing something wrong. You cause nothing but trouble wherever you go. Where to go, jackass. When being harsh to yourself unsurprisingly doesn't nothing to give you emotion, your eyes and mind once again begin to drift. Your gaze lazily floats over the projects in your host's workbench and the lab coats in the wardrobe and work your way around the room until your eyes somehow manage to come back to the table and spy the coffee cake and more importantly the knife beside it you stare at the knife for a long time not entirely sure of yourself where this train of thought is heading but you were but you have a suspicion that the stop lies at the end of at least one long dark tunnel next thing you knew your hand is reaching for its handle Slowly, delicately, moving like you're in a dream. When the knife is in your hand, you look over it, inspecting both sides. Studying the utensil is like an out-of-body experience, like you're watching through the eyes of someone else holding the blade. You catch your reflection in the metal and see a face just as devoid of motion as you felt. You guess you should have been alarmed, but being so fagular aware of yourself as is, you wouldn't have been able to even if you tried. For reasons beyond your understanding, you put the flat of the blade against your left palm. It's smooth and hard, and kind of cold, but sensation stirs something deep within you. For so long now, you've been drifting through each day as nothing more than an empty husk. Unable to remember what emotions felt like. What actual feelings truly felt like. It made you wonder if you could feel the knife. Carefully, purposefully, you rotate the blade until its razor thin edge is practically to your metal carpless and gently very gently you begin to apply pressure you slowly keep pushing until you sense yourself reaching your tolerance threshold when you get to your limit you stop hesitating if you go any further than this you find out if you can feel it but it will be the last thing you do will it be worth it you wait. You debate. You very carefully put the knife back down and let out a breath you don't didn't realize you were holding. Your pulse is rushing and your entire body can't help but tremble. No, you think, firmly coming to a realization. That's the way the kid tried to kill me. I refuse to go out the same way. Not to even mention what it would do to poor Alpheus if she came back to find a pile of dust under a jack and his scarf. Ah, cold feet! A voice mocks you. Your head snaps up so fast, your vertebrae pop. There on the altar, in the pot, where the asters were just a few minutes prior, sits one compellent looking flower. The legs of the chair squeal against the tiles as you force it back when you get to your feet. <coughs> Flowey scolds, curling a leaf around each bottle of dust as your eyes start to ring with blue. Science safety rule number one. No magic in the lab. You wouldn't want to damage any of Alpheus' research projects, would you? His smile grows fangs as he threatens to smash the vials of Metatons and Undyne's ashes on the floor. You sharply inhale, but do not approach. How the hell did you get in here, you demand? I go where I please. You should know that by now. 
Flowey twirls the dust-filled jars with his stem. I must say, I'm disappointed in you. You look like you're really going to commit to throwing yourself into the core until she came along. Did she get in your way? Did she distract you? Do I need to get rid of her for you? You leave Alpheus out of this, you snap. She's worked hard to get back where she is now. Ugh, I know. Ferrari groans and rolls his eyes. She was the next on my list after you. But if you take any longer, I might have to bump up her in the queue. You grimace. This weed has gone too far. Threatening you, all he wants is no skin off your nose. But bringing in bystanders? You're going to rip him from the very soil and incinerate his roots one by one. Grab him by his very essence and thrash him against the walls until he died. No matter how long it would take you, you would make sure he paid for such atrocities. You make a mental grab for the flower with telekinesis, trying to drag him into a fight and settle this once and for all. The world goes dark, your soul pounding in crescendos, and nothing happens. What? Why did it work? You idiot! That little trick doesn't work on me. I have no soul for you to play Puppet Master with, remember? Christ, you are a freaking idiot. How could you forget? Furious, you fire a bone at his head that he easily ducks, and then it beds itself into the wall behind him. Hey, I told you, no magic in the lab. And since you broke the rules... The flower tosses the vials of dust over the edge of the loft before he finishes the sentence. You make a wild die for him, but your reach isn't long enough. No! You yell as you hopelessly watch the jar smash into the ground floor below you. Beyond you, you hear more things shattering and turn to find the pictures in the flower pot kicked off the nightstand, completely destroyed. The yellow flower is nowhere in sight. No, 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 no. Your fingers tremble over the torn photographs and broken uh, cryomate. No magic you knew could fix this. Sans, are you alright? Alfia shouts, running up the escalator. I thought I heard a cup break or something, and... She stops dead in her tracks when she sees you kneeling over the vandalized altar. Her eyes drift to the wall where you... Where your very incriminating bone is still protruding from the plaster. And then down to the ground floor where the shattered glass and dust glint in the light. You make no noise beyond a choking gasp. Elpheus, I... I... You desperately search for words, but none come to you. Alpheus opens and closes her mouth several times, tears welling in her eyes. Elpheus, please... I, I, I did it. You step towards her and she recoils, breathing hard. You can't stop yourself from flinching back yourself. Sans? Her voice is small and weak. I, I, I know you hate humans, and I, I'm sorry to offend you that badly with my memorial, but I, I think you need to leave. Elpheus? Please go, Sans. She interrupts, unable to look you in the eyes. I, I, I'm sorry, but, but please, just, just, just go. You linger, trying, struggling to find a way to explain. You make amends, but nothing comes to you. Even if you told the truth, she wouldn't believe you. Even you, who witnessed it all, would have agreed that the evidence found made you look responsible. Hell! You were responsible in a way, but worst of all, you can't even manage to make yourself actually feel ashamed of it for her sake. With a sigh, you accept defeat and turn to leave the lab. You don't bother apologizing. You knew it wouldn't help. As you walk back through Waterfall, Alpheus' quiet sobs continue to echo in your head, even after you left her far behind.